This video is supported by Brilliant.org. Can you imagine how much it messed people up when microscopes were invented? I mean, think about it. You're going on about your life. You think everything that you see is everything that there is. You think you got a good, you know, beat on things. And then here comes Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, who tells you that actually, no, there's this entire world of bugs that are too small for you to see, covering everything, including and especially you. <laughs> I mean, people used to believe that maggots just came from rotting meat, just spontaneously generated until they realized that, oh no, there's actually flies eggs. They're just too small for us to see. In fact, it started explaining a lot of things that we never really understood before. Things that we used to consider magic or supernatural. Suddenly there was this entire world that was right under our noses the whole time. Microscopes ushered in a revolution that reframed our thinking about life on Earth and our place within it. And the same is true for telescopes. About the same time that microscopes became a thing, telescopes became a thing in the mid 1600s. And that's not a coincidence because the Dutch just suddenly got like really good at making lenses at that time. And astronomers like Johannes Kepler, Christian Huygens, and Galileo Galilei who started pointing these telescopes up at the sky, the night sky that we had been staring at for thousands of years. And they started finding things that we never knew were there. The things they learned were so earth shattering that Galileo was actually imprisoned for learning it because Italy. We learned that we were definitely not the center of the universe, that there were other planets that circled around the sun, and that Galileo had its own moons, just like we do. And as telescopes got bigger and more powerful over the year, we discovered that our sun is just one star out of billions in the Milky Way galaxy, that our galaxy is just one out of billions in the universe, that the universe is expanding, and it's weirder and more amazing than we ever could have thought possible. We've answered so many questions, but we've come up with even more questions along the way. Questions that lay the groundwork for the next generation of telescopes. And God only knows what they'll find. The Event Horizon Telescope was a triumph for humanity, not just because it produced the first image of a black hole ever and proved Einstein right once again, but because it got the whole world talking about telescopes and what we can do with that. It also reiterates just how little our senses can tell us about the universe. I mean, we can only see 5% of the matter out there. All the rest of it is dark matter and dark energy. And if what we can see, only a minuscule fraction is what we can see with our naked eye. That's why we need big, huge telescopes out there scanning the entire electromagnetic spectrum to give us a real view of our cosmic environment. So if you're in the market for an exciting STEM career, astronomy is totally the hotness right now. I mean, the detection of gravitational waves back in 2016 opened up literally an entirely new field of astronomy. And the electromagnetic spectrum still has a lot up its sleeve. And astronomy majors looking for a good minor should consider computer science. After all, it wasn't the telescopes that made this image possible. It was the sophisticated data processing techniques that took five petabytes of data from eight different telescopes around the world to make one image. Over the next decade, data technologists are going to be facing tests that they've never faced before. Current telescopes are already pushing supercomputers to their limits, and the new generation of telescopes are going to make what we have now look manageable. So jumping into these telescopes, you can't talk about future telescopes without mentioning the James Webb Space Telescope, which is absolutely definitely going to launch in 2021, for real this time. I won't go too much into the James Webb because I already did a whole video that covered this a few years back, and there's not really much that's uh, happened since then that I could add to it, except, you know, delays. Actually, no, this was pointed out to me and it wasn't in the other video. Did you know that if you take James Webb Space Telescope and shorten it down to JWST, which a lot of people do to save time, it actually doesn't save any time at all. It's the exact same number of syllables. James Webb Space Telescope, JWST. Boom. Facts. Now, if you don't know about the James Webb Space Telescope, I'll put a link to my video down there, or you can see it, I'll put a little thing here. But yeah, basically, it's, it's a giant version of the Hubble Space Telescope. They'll be able to see things that Hubble could only get a glimpse of, and it's been delayed many times. So I'll move on to another telescope that has also been delayed and might possibly be canceled, unfortunately. This is called the WFIRST Telescope. WFIRST stands for the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. It was actually supposed to be the successor to James Webb, which was the successor to Hubble. And last year, the U.S. government considered defunding WFIRST, and it might actually completely get canceled. Actually, in October this year, NASA needs to make their decision whether or not they're going to keep it or cancel it. Which would suck, because WFIRST is awesome. The awesome sauce of WFIRST is the whole wide field part of it. If Hubble was 480p, then WFIRST is like 
IMAX. Basically, it would be able to scan a hundred times more of the sky with the exact same resolution as Hubble. Like, imagine if Hubble could take a deep field photo of the entire sky. WFIRST could do that. But what really turns it up to 11 is that they were going to use WFIRST in conjunction with the JWST so that they would like survey the sky, find something really interesting, and then narrow in on it with the JWST to get a more close-up, you know, picture of what's going on. That's what I call a dynamic duo. You don't have to call it that. But for now, all we can really do is just cross our fingers and hope it doesn't get canceled this October. If WFIRST does get scrapped, then NASA's next big flagship mission might be LUVOIR, or the Large UV Optical IR Surveyor. I don't know if it's pronounced LUVOIR or LUVOIR. Either way, their acronym game is on point. Similar to James Webb, the LUVOIR uh, telescope would orbit the sun about a million miles from Earth, giving it a completely unobstructed view of space. There are two designs currently being considered for LUVOIR. One is called HDST, and the other one is called At Last, as in, at last they have some really cool acronyms. The biggest difference is size. HDST is kind of nailed down, but At Last is still being worked out. But whichever design is chosen, LUVOIR will have a primary aperture at least 8 meters across. The maximum proposed width is 16.8 meters. And by aperture, I mean mirror in this case. The James Webb will have a mirror the size of 6.4 meters, which even at the smallest scale, LUVOIR would still dwarf it. This jump in aperture size will allow it to directly image and analyze light from Earth-like planets, so this is a huge deal. Up to now, only Jupiter-sized gas giant exoplanets have been directly imaged. It'll do this using a device called ECLIPSE, which stands for Extreme Chronograph for Living Planetary Systems, and the acronyms, my god, so good! Eclipse will use filters and deformable mirrors to seek out extrasolar Earths a billion times fainter than the stars they orbit. At that point, it'll run a spectral analysis to look for signs of water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and other signs of life. LUVAR will be 40 times the power of Hubble and should be able to directly image Earth-like worlds up to 100 light years away. Proxima Centauri b and the Trappist exoplanets are well within that range. Expect full coverage from RoboJo, the cyborg I'll be morphing into over the next decade. Joking aside, there will be a considerable wait for LUVAR. In fact, at the moment, there's not a single rocket in the world that could actually put it up into space. The SLS and the New Glenn and the Starship uh, could do it sometime in the future. In fact, SpaceX did a rendering of the Starship being able to hold LUVAR in it. Luckily, by the time LUVAR goes up, we'll be in a whole new era of ground-based telescopes with extreme apertures. The first on this list is the 30-meter telescope, whose aperture size is, wait for it, 98.4 feet. That's 30 meters. The mirror in the 30 meter will be comprised of 492 reflective surfaces which will dwarf the neighboring Keck telescope on Mauna Kea, Hawaii. Construction on the 30 meter has been delayed quite a bit due to protests from native Hawaiian groups, uh, so there's actually a possibility it might get moved to the Canary Islands. In which case it will dwarf the Grand Telescopio Canarias, which is also one of the largest telescopes currently operating in the world, but a uh, Hawaiian judge did uh, finally clear for construction to start in Hawaii, so it's most likely going to be there. And they've taken a whole lot of steps to make everything right with the, the native Hawaiians. It's, it's, it's a whole thing. I won't go into that here. Whenever it's built, the 30 meter telescope will stand eight stories tall, and its gigantic mirror will have a resolution 12 times sharper than that of the Hubble Space Telescope. That means more ghostly hands, more stellar superclusters, and more wispy nebulae vaster than the human mind can comfortably imagine. The 30 meter will be especially focused on the origins and the structure of the early universe. This, this large aperture gives it the ability to see further and further away. The further away you see, the further back in time you go. It'll also have a sensitivity to infrared and near-infrared light to allow it to image in between the visible and sub-millimeter ranges. There are several categories of large objects, including exoplanets, that show up in richer detail when viewed in infrared. The 30 meter will also study the Kuiper Belt and give us close-up views of uh, asteroids and comets way out there, and these little weird half-planetoid, half-comet things that astronomers call centaurs. Okay, scientists aren't exactly known for their creativity when naming things, but dude, Louvoir, Eclipse, At Last, frickin' centaurs? Sci they are nailing it with the names on this one. Go scientists! Alright, the next extremely large telescope on our list is the, um... Oh, let me check my notes here. Oh, the Extremely Large Telescope. Damn it, scientists! Originally called the European Extremely Large Telescope, this telescope is actually being built in the Atacama Desert of Chile. Uh, its first light is expected in 2025, but it's being built right now. 
This thing has a mirror 39.3 meters wide, which will allow it to resolve impressively faint objects. It's being built at the Cerro Amazones, which isn't as tall as Mauna Kea, but it's 98% cloudless, which is obviously good, and it's desert dry, so less atmospheric distortion. And the distortion it does receive will be dealt with using adaptive optics, small actuators to reposition segments of the mirror. Measurements that tell the mirrors how to reposition will be taken using guide stars or projected laser beams. It works the same way as glasses or contact lenses. When the extremely large switch is on, they're going to try to beat Louvard to the punch to actually be the first to image an Earth-like exoplanet out in space, but it's actually going to be focused also on the expansion of the universe. They'll do this by observing changes at the rate at which light redshifts over time. As light you know, travels through space and space expands, the light gets redshifted. They're going to be measuring that redshift in the sense of universal expansion for the first time ever. Now with the exception of w First, the telescopes that I've been talking about here use arrays of mirrors, but the individual mirrors in the arrays are actually kind of small. That is not true of this next one. In the giant Magellan telescope, six of the biggest mirrors in the entire world at 8.4 meters across each are going to be arranged around a central mirror in a little pedal arrangement. This will give the giant Magellan a 24 meter light collecting diameter, which is actually smaller than some of the other t telescopes here, but it was designed to be simple. The Giant Magellan will have a total of 24 and a half meters of light collecting diameter. It's been designed to be the smallest, but the simplest of the three ground scopes I've mentioned. This doesn't mean it's going to be easy to build. Each of these seven mirrors takes four years to create. They've already got five of them done, there's still two left. And they're being built in a lab underneath the football stadium at the University of Arizona. I'm not making that up. And once they're done, they're going to have to be very gently transported to Chile, where it's going to be about an eight-hour drive away from the extremely large telescope. Adaptive optics would give the Giant Magellan about ten times higher resolution than Hubble, and its first light is expected around 2023. Now, all the telescopes I've talked about have been planned for the near future, but China's 500-meter aperture spherical telescope, or FAST, it's already built, and it's doing work right now. Back in 2016, FAST overtook the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico as the world's largest filled aperture radio telescope. And it's already located dozens of radio emitting pulsars. And it's still in the calibration phase. And while Arecibo does have some capabilities that FAST doesn't have, it can actually uh, send signals as well as receive them, uh, the FAST telescope has a wider view of the sky and it's much more sensitive than Arecibo. Now there have been some problems with the actuators that actually um, adjust the angle of fast equipment, so it's kind of just using the motion of the Earth to scan the sky at the moment. But even Handicapped is producing results. Chief scientist Lee D predicted that they could actually find a thousand new pulsars just by drifting over the next 200 days. And once optimization is complete, they expect the telescope to be producing anywhere from 20 to 30 petabytes of information every year. And despite official denials, some of the scientists working on the project have admitted that part of what they're doing is also looking for alien signals. So could we get another wow signal soon? And if they find one, would they even tell us? Actually, China loves being first, so yeah, I think they would tell us. The last on my list is the least in most of the technical categories I've been talking about here, but it's still something that scientists are really excited about, and it's right around the corner. It's expected to go online in 2022. It's the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, and it's big, but not huge. Its mirror is 8.4 meters wide, and if that sounds familiar, that's the exact same mirror that they're making for the Giant Magellan Telescope. You know, the one underneath the football stadium. This one's also going up in the Atacama Desert of Chile. It has a unique three mirror design that should give it some excellent optical performance, uh, better than a lot of other telescopes out there. But it's not its design that gets people excited. It's what they're going to be doing with it. Specifically, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope is designed to constantly do stellar scans of the skies extremely fast. And if all goes well, it should be able to scan the entire night sky every three nights. Barring any accident, it should be doing this for the next 10 years. It's estimated this telescope will produce 50 petabytes of data every year. That's over half a billion gigabytes of data over its 10-year lifespan. Storing and distributing this data will be a huge IT challenge, not even counting just going through it and making sense of all of it. Planetary astronomers especially love the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. In fact, Mike Brown, one of the scientists who helped kind of remove Pluto's planetary status, he had this to say about it to Discover Magazine. Quote, We'll see patterns we didn't anticipate. Then we'll have to start looking to see what's causing those other patterns. And astrophysicists that study dark matter have a special interest in this telescope because it might be able to point out some patterns that they've never been able to see before. When the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope sees its first light, we will officially enter a new age of mega telescopes. And who knows what kind of things they're going to find. Pulsars, quasars, 
aliens. Now is an exciting time, not just for scientists and astronomers, but for all humankind. Like I said before, every single time we had a step up in our telescope technology, it completely reframed our entire idea of how we fit into the cosmos. In the coming years, Mauna Kea, the Atacama Desert, and the sinkhole that the FAST telescope sits in, they're going to be ground zero for discoveries that are going to completely reshape all of our human knowledge. Discoveries made possible not just by brute force size, but by intelligent data processing and computer technology by computer scientists and data scientists all around the world. If you want to be one of those people, it might be a good idea to get a handle on the fundamentals behind all of this science and technology, and you can do that right now at Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an awesome sponsor of this channel because they are all about learning, and they do so by walking you through a series of puzzles and challenges so you can figure out the subject in a way that makes the best sense to you. And now Brilliant has offline courses that you can take with you anywhere you want to go. If you're on a plane, if you're on a train, automobile, whatever. If you just want to be able to do this without getting constant notifications on your phone, you can do that. And if you're interested in how all this astronomical data is going to be processed, they've got advanced computer science courses, including full courses on artificial neural networks and machine learning, or start from scratch with their computer science fundamentals class. Viewers of this channel can get free access to their weekly brain puzzles and teasers by signing up at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. And if you want to sign up for their premium subscription, it gives you access to all of their courses, both online and offline. You can get 20% off your subscription for life. Yeah, I've been working with Brilliant for a long time now, and it's just been really great watching their platform grow and see all the cool stuff they've been adding to it. So if you haven't checked it out in a while, you might want to go take a look. There's a lot of really cool new stuff going on there. Brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Links down in the description. All right, big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this channel, and a big thank you to my answer files on Patreon that are building an awesome community, helping me build my team, and just uh, being great people. I really love you guys, and thank you so much. There's some people that have joined them. Let me murder their names real quick. Uh, I can't feather for shit. That's a name. Uh, Joshua Rice, <laughs> Luke Sherry, James Holmes, Arnaud Jagerman. Uh, Brandon Kerr, Andrew Dolan, Andrew Offner, Lynn Kenworthy, Tom Lawrence, Jason Dean, Brody McLeod, uh, Manuel Salazar, Ryan Milakovic, Adam Lutz, Jeremy Sabin, Philip Weibel, and Paul Hackett. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get early access to videos, access to me, uh, Patreon-only live streams and that kind of thing, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Please like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, uh, you might want to check out this video. It's on a similar topic. Google thinks you'll like it, or any of the others that might be on the little sidebar over here. And if you do like those, I invite you to subscribe, because I come back with videos just like this every Monday and every Thursday. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.